Welcome back to the third video covering the details of the QMC 5883L 3-axis magnetic sensor. Last time we made each and every bit of information that this sensor can provide available within our Arduino code. We also made the polling of the data via I2C interrupt driven. Card here, link in the description. Now it's time to actually do something useful with that data. For example, calculate a compass direction. But before we can do that, we have to calibrate our little sensor here. And all that will unfortunately involve a whole lot of theory, I'm afraid. But anyway, enjoy. In the basics, card here, link in the description, I showed you that picture from the datasheet and you find these errors in the picture also on the breakout board for the chip. I explained to you back then that these errors do not indicate a rotational axis, but they indicate directions of magnetic field lines in which each of the sensors X, Y, Z gives out its maximum positive reading. I went on explaining that really the Y and the X sensor gives you rotational information about the magnetic field around the Z axis here. And that really the Z sensor gives you just information about the inclination of the Z plane. So the plane of the chip within the magnetic field. Unfortunately, that was only about a third of the truth. Uh, well, it depends on how you're counting a sixth of the truth. The chip indeed contains three completely identical magnetic sensors in an orthogonal arrangement. So 90 degrees between each of them. And if we look at that picture in this orientation, that's exactly the same like that picture here. However, we could turn our chip upside down and we could still use the X and Y sensor to measure the rotation of the magnetic field around the Z axis. Only the signs of the measurement outputs from X and Y would be reversed. And the same holds true if we put Y here, then we use Z and X and we can let point Y downwards, we can still use X and Z, yeah, reversed signs. And the same also holds true with X pointing upwards or downwards. So it really doesn't matter in which orientation you mount your breakout board or the chip directly on a PCB. As long as you do the math right, you can get out compass readings. And we'll do that math after we calibrated that chip. Now, why do these sensors need calibration? I already showed you in the basics video that without proper calibration, the values you measure with these sensors seem to be all over the place. And there are three reasons for that. First, the sensors themselves have of course tolerances. For example, if I have a magnetic field here perfectly perpendicular to the sensor or no field at all, I expect the reading of zero, but I might not get a reading of zero. The reading might be a little bit to the negative or the positive. That's easy to fix. I simply take the raw reading for axis and subtract some bias so that zero readings are really zero. Also, if I have, for example, a magnetic field going right through the sensor with one gauss, the reading might be 0.9 gauss or 1.1 gauss. That's equally easy to fix. We simply take our raw value already corrected for the offset by our bias and multiply that with a scale to get our calibrated reading. Second, there are so-called hard iron errors, meaning there is somewhere a fixed magnetic field influencing our sensor. In this example, the straight green lines are the magnetic field lines of the Earth, which we want to measure. And this little magnet sends additional field lines through our sensor, offsetting the result again. 
By the way, this doesn't have to be a magnet. This could just be a PCB trace with current flowing through it. That would also generate a magnetic field. These hard iron arrows, since they generate a fixed offset, can be of course corrected with our bias. Third, there are soft iron arrows, meaning there is some ferromagnetic material near our sensor distorting the magnetic field we want to measure. These could be pins, leads, screws, whatever, anything ferromagnetic. In this example, this ferromagnetic block is weakening the magnetic field of the earth going through our sensor. But it could also work the other way around. If I had two ferromagnetic blocks here in front and at the back of my sensor, I could lens additional magnetic field lines from the earth through the sensor. So this error is proportional. And being proportional errors, we can correct them with our scale factor. Please note that we treated all these errors as linear and for the purpose of this video we will continue doing so. However, so far we just looked at a single sensor in 2D, but we have to correct these errors for three sensors in 3D space. So, what's the goal of calibration in three dimensions? I've drawn here our axis again, but this time these are the axis of our measurement values in 3D space. As you can see, our sensors or measurement values are completely uncalibrated. So each axis has a different scale between 1 and minus 1 Gauss and the zero point is also on a different place on each axis. Now let's assume we have a magnetic field of exactly one Gauss going that direction. Here's the X arrow and we slowly rotate our sensor around the Z axis going up here. Then we get this dotted line here of measurement values within the X Y plane. Now we turn our little sensor in the same magnetic field around the x-axis. Then our measurements would follow in the z-y plane <laughs> this dotted line here. Uh, pretty chaotic, huh? Still the same magnetic field and we rotate now around the y-axis. Then our measurement values follow within the z-x plane that dotted line here, yeah. Uh, after we've done the calibration, the measurement values should form perfect circles in the three planes we have here. Moreover, if you not just rotate around a single axis each time, but nilly vanilly in 3D space, our measurement points should form a perfect sphere around the zero point. In our example, we had a magnetic field of exactly one Gauss. So the radius of our circles, respectively of our sphere, should be exactly one. If you have only a magnetic field with half a Gauss, then the sphere has only a radius of half a Gauss. Now I want to show you two methods for actually doing that calibration. The first method you can call correction matrix. It's highly sophisticated and state of the art. There's a link to an article about it in the description. We first take our raw values for x, y and z and we subtract biases for x, y and z, correcting the zero offset of each axis. Then we take the result and multiply it with a matrix and this gives us the calibrated values for x, y and z. Just in case you have forgotten how matrix multiplication works. So if we have a vector here with three numbers, x, y, z, and we multiply that with a 3 by 3 matrix A to I, the result is again a vector with three numbers. And these three numbers are calculated as follows. So first number is ax plus by plus zz. Second number is dx plus ey plus fz and third number 
is gx plus hy plus iz. Meaning each of our calibrated values x, y, z contains components from each of our raw values x, y, z, allowing you to make very fine adjustments here so you get really perfect circles respectively spheres. So this method is perfect, but of course it has some drawbacks. And the first one is that matrix is quite hard to calculate. I've seen a Windows program doing it and I've seen a MATLAB program doing it, but I've never seen any microprocessor code for it. Uh, but it might be doable on an Arduino. But the second drawback is what really makes this method unsuitable for at least some applications. The calibration procedure requires some precision, meaning you have to put your sensor into 12 exactly predefined positions, take readings in these positions and with these readings you calculate the matrix. If that thing here is in a housing somewhere or stowed away somewhere, you might not be able to do that. I want to point out here, if we assume the yellow parts of the matrix to be all zero, so we only have non-zero numbers in the diagonal, AEI, then we get something like this. So our calibrated value is equal a scaling factor times the raw value minus a bias. And we are back at the formula for calibrating in the 2D case. The second method, which we'll be actually using, can be called scaled biases. And there are links to two articles about that method in the description. The calibration procedure itself consists of determining the maximum and minimum readings on each axis. We already did that in the basics video. Then we calculate the bias for each axis from its maximum reading plus its minimum reading divided by 2. So just determining the zero point on the axis. Next we calculate the delta between the maximum reading and the minimum reading for the axis, also divided by 2. Please note that divided by 2 is kinda optional because it will get lost in the math further down. Afterwards, we sum up all the deltas from our axis x, y, z and divide that by 3 to get an average delta. Finally, we calculate the scale for each axis as the average delta divided by the delta of the axis. Please note, the bias calculation here makes sure that all our axes have the same zero point in space. The calculation of the delta for each axis and then from that the average delta and finally the scale for each axis from the average delta and the delta of each axis makes sure that each axis in 3D space has exactly the same scale. Please also note that unlike the matrix method, this method only makes sure that these six points in space on the axis plus the zero point are correctly calibrated. Anyway, for many applications that's good enough and in the end we take our calculated biases and scales and put them into the formula we already know from our 2D case. And that's how the code for it looks like. We are at version 4 now. We have a new type destruct calibration that holds the minimum and maximum numbers for our three axes. We also have two new type def structs, calibrated data access and calibrated data array, which are exactly the same like our existing raw data access and raw data array, but using float values instead of integers. We have three calibration methods here, set calibration, which gets an argument, obviously a calibration struct, and then reset calibration and recall calibration. We will look into the details of these methods when we have a look at the CPP file. 
Analog to our already existing raw data retrieval methods, we have now here a whole bunch of calibrated data retrieval methods. Besides the name difference, yeah, calibrated instead of raw, these methods return float data and calibrated data instead of raw registered data in integers. Finally, we have three new private members here, a uh, calibration struct of course, then a long array with the biases and a float array with the scales. The begin method in our CPP file now also does a reset calibration and recall calibration. The new set calibration method simply sets our private member calibration to the calibration struct we pass as an argument and then does a recall calibration. Reset calibration simply sets within our calibration data for each axis the minimum and maximum values to the possible integer minimum and maximum. The magic happens within the recall calibration method. There we calculate for each axis the biases, yeah, we saw the formula for that, and then the deltas, we also saw the formula for that, and I'm not dividing by two here, and we also sum up in delta all the deltas to get our average delta, which we use later on to calculate for each axis again the scale. The calibrated data access function uses the raw data access function to get the raw data for an axis, then subtracts the bias for the axis and multiplies the whole thing with the scale for the axis. The rest of the calibrated data functions is exactly the same like the raw data functions, with the exception that they of course use the calibrated data access function instead of the raw data access function. In the sketch itself, I have now a global boolean error here. More about that later. In the setup, instead of printing out errors I encounter, I simply set this error variable to true. There's also a slight change to the configuration. Now our range is 8 gauss instead of 2 gauss. Remember in part 2, already called link in the description, we encountered some range overflow errors. So we want to avoid that. I also, after I successfully wrote the configuration, set now the calibration. And I created some new calibration data here with that calibration script I showed you in the basics video, uh, also already carded, link in the description. Uh, and here is the calibration data we did back then. And if you compare the numbers, they are not quite the same, but very similar. Okay, and if I've done all that, I set error to false. The rest is unchanged and we can have a look at the loop. If I encountered an error in the setup and the error flag is set, then I immediately exit the loop and do nothing. This part here is unchanged, just the handling of the data ready flag set by the interrupt routine. And then if I have a successful data read, I plot my data and in this case the raw data. Later on we will of course plot the calibrated data, but let's start with the raw data first. The new plot data function just formats the data nicely for the Arduino serial plotter. Uh, we will use the serial plotter to visualize the data. And that's also the reason that I have no longer serial prints for any errors because that would just mess things up in the serial plotter. Okay. Here we have the raw data from our three sensors. So blue is X, red is Y and green is Z. And if I now rotate around the Z axis, remember raw data with, yeah, <clears throat> I'm trying to do it at a steady pace. We see two sign signals here on blue and red. So X and Y. And they are, because these sensors are 90 degrees offset, the sign signals are 90 degrees offset. And as you can see, they have um, approximately the same scale, 
but their zero lines are um, offset. Yeah, that's why we did the calibration and hopefully this will get better when we have a look at the calibrated data. Now I can do exactly the same with the Z axis and the X axis if I put it on the side here and rotate again. So blue and green should be now our signals. And here yeah, seems to be working quite nicely. But of course there is an offset again. The scale of both signals looks relatively good. Of course we can also do that with Z and Y, so red and green. And you see the scale of the both signals are the same, or approximately the same, but the offset between the signals is enormous here. Now our calibrated signals and again here rotating around the x-axis and yeah well what can I say this looks a little bit underwhelming huh <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, let's try another axis. So again, uh, the Z and X axis. Yeah, again, a bit underwhelming. Okay, let's try the last combination. Z and Y axis. Oh, that actually looks perfect. So calibration worked for that, huh? So they have exactly the same offset both signals and exactly the same amplitude. This is actually usable to calculate a compass direction. But um, <clears throat> yeah. But I have another trick up my sleeve. When I did these first two calibrations here, I rotated the sensor around all three axes while calibrating it, okay? And this third set of calibration data here, I got when I only rotated it around the Z axis. And this should give us in theory a very good calibration for the X and Y axis. We'll see. So now just have a look at the blue and red, the X and Y. Well, not completely perfect, but quite good, wouldn't you say? Yeah, this is absolutely usable and we can continue with that. But, uh, <clears throat> I mean, <clears throat> that scaled biases method is really not good for full calibration in three dimensions, is it? I mean, if I rotate around that axis now here, yeah, that just looks terrible, which was to be expected. But anyway, we're already 25 minutes in, but I promised you in the intro that we would calculate the compass direction from the sensor data. So let's have a look at the math involved. I've drawn the X sensor here with its arrow indicating its most positive output direction. And please note the color here is not the color we saw in the Arduino serial plotter, but the color I used here in that picture. And if it's pointing obviously to north, we get the maximum positive output. If it would be pointing to south, we would get the most negative output. And if it points to west or to east, we get a zero output, at least when we calibrate the data. And if we plot the signal on an axis from zero degrees to 360 degrees, we get a cosine curve. So with a single sensor, we know when we are pointing to north or to south, but we cannot make a distinction between east and west. In both cases, the signal is just zero. Uh, 
enter the Y sensor here in green. It's obviously offset 90 degrees from the X sensor. So its output is initially zero and then goes to full positive, zero again, full negative and back to zero as we rotate it. The output from the Y sensor plotted on our axis is of course a sine curve. And if we combine both signals, we can make a decision if we are pointing to east or to west. Yeah, zero in both cases from the X sensor, but when we are pointing to east, we get the most positive signal from the Y sensor. And when we are pointing to west, we get the most negative signal from the Y sensor. Now, if there just would be a trigonometric function combining our Y and X signal to give us an output between 0 and 360 degrees. So, let's do some trigonometry then, shall we? Maybe you remember that picture here from your math classes. That's basically a unit circle. That is, this is a more general case where the radius of the circle is not exactly 1 but generalized to R. Reason being, our signal amplitude here is not necessarily exactly one. It can be anything. We have an x-axis and we have a y-axis and at the center of the circle where both meet we have zero. Then we have our four quadrants of the circle, one, two, three, four. And of course the scale around the circle is not in degrees but in radians. So starting from zero, pi half, pi, three pi half and back to zero or two pi. And don't get hung up on the fact that the radiant scale here is counterclockwise while the degree scale on a compass is clockwise. It really doesn't matter. Then we have here the infamous right angle triangle with its sides A, B and C. C obviously having the same length as R of our circle. We've already seen the sine and cosine function. I mean, I've drawn them here. But anyway, the length of side A is the radius times the sinus of the angle alpha here. And the length of side B is the radius times the cosine of the angle alpha. So as alpha goes around the circle here, the length of A and the length of B, which could be of course negative in between, gives us exactly here our sine and cosine curve between 0 and 2 pi, respectively 0 degree and 360 degree. Now, there are inverse functions for sine and cosine, and they are the arcosine and the arcos cosine. The arcosine of A divided by R is our angle alpha, and the arcos cosine of B divided by R is also our angle alpha. And we want that angle alpha here, don't we? But as we have already seen, the arcosine cannot distinct between the right and the left quadrants, while the arcos cosine cannot distinct between the upper and the lower quadrants. That was the problem here with that single X sensor not being able to tell if it's pointing towards west or towards east. And we concluded that we would have to combine both signals to get really our compass heading. There is the arcus tangens function that gives you for A over B, so both our signals, the angle alpha. Problem here is it's really only defined for the first quadrant and not even up to P half or 90 degrees because there B is obviously zero and we cannot divide by zero. Also, the information about in which quadrant we are gets totally lost in that division here because a positive number divided by a positive number is obviously positive, so here quadrant 1, but a negative divided by a negative is also a positive number, quadrant 3. And if you divide a positive number by a negative number or a negative number by a positive number in both cases, quadrant 2 and 4, the result is negative. Ah. Enter the arcos tangens 2 function which gets B and A as separate arguments and gives you the angle alpha 
for the whole circle from zero back to two pi. It does that by making six case distinctions whether b is zero or not and the signs of b and a. So we have four cases here depending on the signs of b and a for the four quadrants and then we have two extra cases here when b is actually zero. At its core it uses of course the arcus tangens function. Of course, we are already getting the B, so the cosine, from our X sensor and the A, so the sine, from our Y sensor. So we simply put the X and the Y signal from the sensor into our arcus tangens function and we're done. Well, almost, because the arcus tangens 2 function is defined for the first and second quadrant to be going from 0 via p half to pi, while it's defined in the fourth and third quadrant going from 0 to minus pi half to, yeah, approaching here at 180 degree minus pi, but at exactly 180 degrees it is actually pi. To get around that we have to distinct two cases. If our arcus tangens 2 is greater or equal 0, then we take our arcus tangens 2. But if our arcus tangens 2 is smaller than 0, then we take our arcus tangens 2 and add 2 pi to it. And at the end we divide by pi and multiply by 180 degrees, so we actually get a scale here from 0 all around to 360. After all of that math, the actual code implementing it is trivial and we are at version 5 now. In the header file we have a new float function here, azimuth set up, which gives us obviously the azimuth for set pointing up and it's zero degrees when x is pointing to north. Remember we could calculate the compass direction for all six orientations of the chip if we wanted to. It really takes only three lines to implement that function in our CPP file. First I have here a float variable alpha, that's our alpha angle and I calculate that as the arcus tangens 2 from the calibrated data for the y axis and the calibrated data for the x axis. Please note here that the mathematical definition of arcus tangens 2 expects first the value for the x-axis and then the value for the y-axis, while the C++ implementation first gets the y-axis value and then the x-axis value. The result is checked if it's smaller than 0, if that's the case I add 2 pi to alpha, otherwise I just take alpha and the whole thing is multiplied by 180 and divided by pi and I return that. In the sketch itself within the loop, if I successfully read data, then I just print out that azimuth setup. And that's how the whole thing looks on the Arduino serial monitor. I've indicated here north on my desk because um, I cannot keep the compass inside the picture, the reason being. Yeah, it's a magnet and the compass will influence uh, my electronic compass and yeah, that board will influence my yeah, mechanical uh, compass. So let's put that out of the picture and align X to north and we have, oh yeah, something plus minus, let me take my hands out. Yeah, within five degrees, not too bad uh, for the kind of calibration we have. And let's point it to south and we get, yeah, not quite 180 degrees. There, yeah, again, we are five degrees off or something. Um, now let's point that to, what it is west so yeah not quite 270 but near it 
and we point it to east and we get oh, almost spot on 90 degrees also yeah a little bit flimsy plus minus five degrees but all in all uh, not too bad for the kind of calibration we did so where does that leave us? Obviously the performance of the so-called scaled biases method of calibration or how I would call it simply min-max method is a wee bit underwhelming. And we will have to revisit our mathematically full Monty, the correction matrix method. But fear not, I already found a relatively easy to use and available uh, Windows program for calculating that matrix and these biases from some calibration data that you take with your sensor. So, till next time, bye.